Hello and welcome to the second installment of the 2023 season of Emory University's Health Storytelling Project, a Q&A series with authors of fascinating new books about health and science. I'm Maren McKenna. I'm a journalist and author and senior fellow in the Center for the Study of Human Health at Emory University, and I'm the curator and host of this series. In a moment, I'll introduce you to my guest, essayist and memoirist Jennifer London and her fascinating new book from Harper Wave, American Breakdown, Our Ailing Nation, My Body's Revolt, and the 19th Century Woman Who Brought Me Back to Life. But first, let me tell you about this series. At least once per month during the academic year, we invite writers whose journalistic or academic books examine health, the science and history of health, and health's intersection with the body. This series of conversations originates at the Emory Center for the Study of Human Health, and the entire year of productions is co-sponsored by the Georgia Center for the Book, an affiliate of the Library of Congress, and Science Gallery Atlanta, which presents exhibits that live at the juncture of science and art and ignite creativity and discovery. This year, for the first time, we're joined by a new co-sponsor, whom I'm absolutely thrilled to announce, the Decatur Book Festival, the largest independent book fest in the United States. Book fans may know that the DBF, as it's called, is taking a post-pandemic hiatus to rethink its goals and strategies. And in that pause, we are delighted to bring these authors in our series to the festival's passionate supporters. So let me tell you who's appearing. I had to do a little bit of production there, sorry. Our theme this semester is how patients identify illnesses that medicine initially does not recognize and how patient communities are forced to become their own advocates and persuade researchers to collaborate with them. Tonight, as I mentioned, I'm in conversation with Jennifer London, an essayist and cultural critic living in Maine whose book American Breakdown interweaves London's experience of mysterious fatigue with the story of the brilliant, witty 19th century diarist Alice James, who spent much of her adulthood bedridden. In September, I talked to biochemist and science author Quinn Eastman, author of The Woman Who Couldn't Wake Up, Hypersomnia and the Science of Sleepiness. And on November 2nd, I'll talk to M Amy Doxer Marcus, a Wall Street Journal reporter and Pulitzer Prize winner, whose book, We the Scientists, How a Daring Team of Parents and Doctors Forged a New Path for Medicine, explores how a group of parents whose children had been diagnosed with a rare and fatal genetic condition transformed themselves into citizen scientists to reach for a cure and save their children's lives. This series is live streamed on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and X, formerly known as Twitter, and archived on YouTube. One final note, if you are watching us on October 5th, you are experiencing a live event. You can interact with us and we encourage you to do that. If you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, your comments will come through to our live stream platform. We apologize that this integration doesn't work for X, formerly known as Twitter, but you are welcome to post your comments and tag our account. If you comment, our producer, Stefan Kaplan of Spin It Social, will make sure we see what you've said and we'll put your question up on screen when I pose it to our guest. Do note that I'll turn to your questions in the second half of this 60 minute live stream, but you can put your questions into any of the comment boxes at any time. Now, let's turn to our book and guest. Jennifer London is an essayist and poet and a licensed clinical social worker who lives in Maine. She's won a Pushcart Prize, has received a Maine Arts Fellowship and a Breadloaf Rona Jaffe Foundation Scholarship, and also has been awarded an array of grants and fellowships, including from Yaddo. 
She is Canadian by birth and a Mainer by migration, and she prefers to be addressed by her family name, London. So, London, welcome to this series. Thank you for having me here, Maren. I'm so happy to be talking about this stuff. So this is such a rich book. There's so much in it, so many strands. So let's just start at the beginning. <laughs> Take us back to work, where you were when this story began. It's a while ago now, a couple of decades, I think. But who were you then and, and what were you doing? So I moved to Maine from Canada in 1989, in early 1989, to start my adult life. And I had dreamed of being free and being a grown up since I was a very young child. Um, and I, I actually was born um, in Texas on the army base during the Vietnam War to two American parents. But then my dad's job transferred him to Canada when I was about six. So I grew up in Canada and that's where I got my education. But at 20, I was 21, I just moved to the US and suddenly started feeling very fatigued. I, um, I didn't know why. I finally went to a walk-in clinic. So here in America, I didn't have health insurance, whereas in Canada, I, I'd always been covered. Um, I went to a walk-in clinic and was diagnosed ultimately with a case of mononucleosis. Um, and it was so bad that I had to quit the job that I had just started and I had to go on welfare. And, um, and I, and then it never got better. So I remember being at university and people coming down with mononucleosis and how it would completely flatten them. I remember my boyfriend sleeping for what seemed like a couple of weeks, but and so there, that that knowledge was in the culture that there was this infection out there that would cause you to go down for a while. But there must have been a point where you realized what you had couldn't be just mono because you weren't getting better. Yeah, and I think I yes, I um at the same time in the culture there was a, you know, a growing awareness um uh, that was hitting the media quite a lot of an illness that was being dismissively called the yuppie flu um, and was just the year before I fell ill was named chronic fatigue syndrome by the Centers for Disease Control, uh, uh, yeah, Centers for Disease Control um, by scientists who really didn't think it was anything other than hysterical women. I mean, that wouldn't have been the term they used, but they didn't think it was real. They thought it was a mental illness. Um, and my fatigue, I mean, it was so stressful at this time when I was starting to supposed to be starting my adult life. I just moved into my own apartment. I'd moved hundreds of miles from my home, started a new job that I couldn't keep doing. Um, it, I was just um, in extreme poverty, had to pay for all my health care out of pocket and um, and wondering why it wasn't getting better. And terrified that it wasn't getting better because I just wanted my life back, this life that I dreamed of. And so, and um, the roommate of a friend of mine had chronic fatigue syndrome, which we now call myalgic encephalomyelitis slash chronic fatigue syndrome or MECFS. Um, and she gave me a lot of information about, about um, MECFS. And I brought that to my doctor, and my doctor was dismissive. And ultimately, told me I was just depressed and the best thing for me would be to go back to work and um, doctors have a lot of power and I was I needed her signature in order to not have to work for my welfare and she um, at that point refused to sign that form um, and I did try to do my work for welfare and it only made me worse and I found another doctor. So looking back with the benefit of, of a couple of decades of integrating this experience for yourself. Um, you, you know, you, you sound now like you, you can deliver this, this tragic history in a very calm and matter of fact manner, <laughs> but I'm, I am imaginatively trying to put myself in the, the emotional position of someone who's 
beginning their adult life in their 20s feels desperately ill, is at the, on the verge of, of losing the first job they've ever had, can't even take care of your pet adequately, um, and, and not being believed. And we're going to talk more, of course, about that, that sense of not being believed, but my heart is breaking for, for you as you were then. It must have been so lonely. Oh, thank you. Yes, you got through my professional, my professional delivery with that beautiful reflection of how it felt. It was so lonely and so terrifying. And in fact, just today I went to see my wonderful nurse practitioner. I've gotten much, much more discerning and selective about uh, my healthcare providers, and she's amazing. And I was talking with her about this one structural thing happening in my body, and but it seems to be getting better. But you know, when you have a history of MECFS, you know, it's a trauma history. You know, your body actually has the capability of not ever getting better. And it makes any, um, any sort of weird thing that's happening in your body um, extra scary. And then there's another part of you that sort of has to talk that part down and try to calm you down. And, and she said, and I was sort of explaining that to her. And she said, that sounds like PTSD. Mm -hmm. And I do write about that a little bit in the book. And um, I, I don't think that my level of trauma rates quite as PTSD per the uh, DSM-5, which is the diagnostic manual that therapists and psychiatrists use. But um, it is a trauma. It's a deep trauma, and which is why I'm hypervigilant when I'm around new, when I'm very careful about new medical providers and hypervigilant until I know that I can trust them. Um, and that's deep in there. So at, I have spent most of my career as a journalist covering epidemics and disasters. Um, and there was a point where I had PTSD as a result of some of my experiences in the field. Um, and the thing that I most remember about it, in, in addition to the usual predictable symptoms, was the sense that I was letting myself down by not being tough enough. That this was a an experience that people go through far worse. The people whom I was writing about had gone through far worse. And and who was I to feel so to to feel this so strongly? And why was I not tougher? And I wonder if if you experienced that when you tried to integrate this being ill and being disbelieved about being ill. I love that question because, and I did write about this early in the book when I was describing those early days, walking back from the, the walk-in clinic um, and really grappling with this idea, is this in my mind or is this in my body? And I really wanted it to be in my body because I felt like if it was in my mind, if it was like imaginary, that it would be harder to get over. And, you know, one of the things I learned in the process of writing the book is how much our mind and body, like, it's such a false dichotomy that we just split right here. It's not true. Our brain connects to all the other systems and parts in the body. And, um, and stressors have a huge effect on people's health. Um, so I want to say that. Um, and yes, um, I was somebody who really prided myself, and I still am, on my strength as just being a strong human. And I'll also just say as an aside that um, anybody who goes through an illness as um, debilitating as mine, and there are a vast array of them, just to get through it takes a kind of ferocious strength that most people couldn't imagine. Um, but the other piece that I loved when I was researching the book, and it was towards the end of my work on the book, I happened to read Sarah Ramey's book called um, uh, The Lady's Guide to Her Mysterious Illness. And she had a mysterious uh, fatigue and chronic pain. And um, she has her own special voice. So she she's so worth reading just because like she has her own. There's, there's kind of humor in it, even though it's hor horrifying what she has gone through. But at the end, she wrote about the idea of the hero's journey and how limiting that was because it was designed for the idea of men. And so she did a lot of research on the heroine's journey. 
And one of the one of the things that she came to at the end that just blew my mind that we have this whole idea in this culture that being able to think linearly and being able to not feel, to separate our feelings and be strong is um, how we should, it's the best way to be, is superior to any other way. And of course, those are like, those are qualities that we naturally think of as masculine qualities. And then, but she does this beautiful job that I won't be able to, um, to do justice to. Of, but of giving the idea of like the 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 heroine's journey is about going down and in, and so she bases that on um, ancient myths, and of sort of the hero the heroine's journey has to do with a kind of death. It has to do with empathy and compassion and uh, making the earth grow like what's underneath. It's not about like slaying dragons and being in the sun. It's about sort of what's underneath. And then like, ultimately she says, it's actually good to be vulnerable. Like our bodies, particularly women's are giving us information about the fact that this, the way we're living right now in the culture that we're in is unsustainable. And do you, did you know that um, men get about almost one hour more per day of leisure than women? Don't, don't cite me, go to the book for that, but like just, just a little tiny tidbit. And so um, for me to have Sarah Raimi basically give me permission to be as delicate as I am, I'm strong and I'm in a delicate body and I need to honor both and in fact my delicate body is giving me really important information um so that i can take care of it the way that it needs so the fact that we can bring a, a gender analysis to this that there are certain qualities that are thought of as masculine and elevated and heroic and certain qualities that we assign to women and that we don't value perhaps as much as we should um, is so resonant to me because as we look back through medical history, so many conditions that were thought of initially to give them a, a neutral and formal term psychogenic or more precisely all in their heads <laughs> were, were conditions that were reported by women. Yeah. Um, they were the, you know, the, the initial sufferers of Lyme disease in Connecticut in, I guess, the 70s or maybe 1980s were moms of small kids who were experiencing symptoms themselves and seeing them in their kids. There have been, uh, you know, there was an epidemic of sort of laughing disease among um, among female children in a, a school in Tennessee about 20 years ago. There are all the various conditions that women report um, even things that we now know to actually be, have a physical basis for sure, like, you know, varieties of, of premenstrual disorders um, that, that initially have been dismissed by medicine as not fitting the dominant paradigm. And the reason is the dominant paradigm is male and the people experiencing this are female. But what, what I love so much about the book is that you find another woman to sort of be your spirit guide out of this. And, and that's the 19th century diarist, Alice James. So talk to us for a minute about how you found her. You literally found her and, um, and what her story meant to you. Okay. Um, first, I feel like, I, I do feel like it's important to address this idea of male, female, just a tiny bit more because we're coming, becoming so much more conscious about um, the amount of uh, gender non-conformity there is. And I really believe that masculinity and femininity are on a spectrum and um, any, we all have qualities of both, but, but those are like as, this, the assigned ideas of masculinity and femininity. And, um, but I'll talk about, but I want to talk about Alice because, um, so I had been sick for five years when I went to a used bookstore just to browse and I um, noticed a book. Um, I probably just saw the spine, Alice James, a biography. 
it's even more worn now than it was at the time. But this is the book that changed my life. It's written by Jean Strauss. And I'd heard of Alice James. I knew that she had suffered from a similar fatigue and that she'd been completely debilitated by it. And so I bought the book. And when I read it, I felt like I'd found my soul sister and like I was no longer alone. So back to that idea of loneliness. I knew there were other people who had this illness out there, but it's, it is just so lonely, particularly when the culture does not validate um, that you're sick at all. And the basic foundational cultural belief is that you're just making it up for, for um, side benefits, like getting to live on welfare. <laughs> um, and and so reading that book just sort of lit me up. I no longer felt alone. Alice had such a such a wit. She was so smart. And like I would have wanted to hang out with her. And then, but I also got really curious about her illness and whether it might actually be the same or similar to MECFS. Because her primary symptom for most of her life was a debilitating fatigue. She did also suffer sometimes from depression, just like I did. It's pretty normal to be depressed when you're bedridden and you can't live the life that you want to live. Um, and later in life, she had some other symptoms. But that sort of launched me. So it was 1994 that I found the book. I was finishing my bachelor's in English very part-time. And then I finished my master's in social work. And it was the year before I graduated that I started, I did a research paper, I think. And then I started asking the, the interlibrary loan, no, not the, the research librarian for help looking into whether anybody else had explored the question of whether Alice's illness, which was called neurasthenia, and my illness, MECFS, might be one and the same thing. And she helped me find some first papers and then you like read through the end notes and then you can find more papers. And it was like heavenly and thrilling and exciting. And I knew that I wanted to write a book about this. And I wanted to write a book, not just about Alice and me, but also about, um, also to validate the, the these illnesses that are so misunderstood. And I, if you, if you, if it's okay, I'd like to go back to one other piece that you said. Sure, go Is ahead. Okay? Yeah, please do. <laughs> <laughs> because you were talking about um, sort of these illnesses. I call them, um, what, what do I call them? Mult Multi-system, systemic, complex, multi-system illnesses. So that's like MECFS, multiple chemical sensitivity, which is often has overlap with MECFS, long COVID, chronic Lyme, POTS, probably dysautonomia, dysautonomia. there's all kinds and, and uh, autoimmune diseases that are, they're not linear, they're not illnesses you can look at for one thing and that will give you the diagnosis and there's a, a, a quick treatment for it. These are multi-system illnesses that affect the whole body and it kind of makes sense to me that the that they are more likely to affect women and it absolutely makes sense to me that medicine doesn't know what to do with them because medicine has spending has been spending centuries trying to figure out how to fix men that it's been they've used men to do the research on and there's been legislation now to try to include women and make sure people of color are also included in research but it's still not adequate um and so the research that we have is based on what works for men. So and I believe that there's a way to, uh, to approach, and then I'll stop. I, I believe there's a way to approach medicine that's different from this um, uh, Cartesian mechanistic way that has to do with systems theory, um, which is a, which is a, I think it's considered a category of chaos theory that really recognizes that all the systems are interconnected. So I want to go back to Alice because I want to make sure that we spend adequate time on her. She deserves it. I think probably that many people who are watching may not be familiar with her story or they may have heard her name, but they may only have heard her name in relation to her at the time more famous brothers. Uh, William, the father of psychology in America, right? And yeah. Henry, the essayist and novelist, 
people might know him for the 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 mystery thriller ghost story the turn of the screw mm -hmm. but alice was their beloved younger sister very bright who took to her bed as a, a late teenager, right? Mm -hmm. And essentially uh, almost never got up again. And she was part of an epidemic that was sweeping at least the industrialized world at the time, at mm -hmm. the, the, the cusp of the, I guess, industrial revolution. Um, that, that you mentioned the name of it. It was, it was called neurasthenia and uh, it was very widely distributed. So talk a bit about that history because I think it's really important to now. Well, I, one of the things that I think is interesting is that um, Alice's illness, neurasthenia, was um, has even more recently um, in the 80s and 90s and even after that by feminists been viewed as an illness of women who were oppressed by the system, by the patriarchy. And, you know... I don't want to discount that there's a there could be a level of truth of that because one of the things I learned as I was researching the book was how much stress impacts our immune system. And to me, it's a stressor to have to constrain yourself, which think about it, they were also wearing dresses that constrain them, right? Like they had a whole constraint. And in fact, there's research, I swear I just read something today about it was an article about how women's silence creates health issues. It was in Time magazine. I don't remember the author. Um, and so think of all these women who didn't have voices, who were told that their only career was to take care of men and children and uh, weren't even allowed to consider that they had um, something more to bring to society. And so if they were bad at being wives and, and, mo and mothers, then they were simply failures. Whereas, you know, now we have... if we have the choice to not do those things and we have the choice to look at for what we're actually good at. So there's that piece, but then there was, you know, why were all these women getting so sick? And I can't say that I found a definitive answer, just like we don't have a definitive answer for why people are falling ill with MECFS. And we don't even have a definitive, we know why we know the start of long COVID, but we don't know why. We don't know why some people just get sick and don't get better. Um, though some some are getting better just very slowly. Um, but one of the things that really blew my mind was that um, in the 19th century, arsenic was a common product in the in a lot of things, including wallpaper. So it was um, it was used in wallpaper to make this beautiful uh, shade of green that had never been seen before, and which offset, I'm sure, the sort of browns and grays of the um, early industrial revolution and what it was doing to our air and our water here and in England. And um, and it was also it was used in candy wrappers. It was used in playing cards and in candles. And the, the symptoms of, um, of illness from um, arsenical wallpapers were, have a lot of overlap with the symptoms of neurasthenia. And so I couldn't get, to, again, to any definitive thing. But what I can say is I had thought that the 19th century was a cleaner and purer time. Mm -hmm. um, and I was, I don't know... I kind of wonder where I got that now, but uh, I was set straight by my uh, uh, friend who's a professor. And um, I mean, there was there were a lot of toxicants and also um, in the gas lighting. So there's carbon monoxide, you know, in people's homes to various levels. So when you think of all the the physical insults, the mm -hmm. the the industrial pollutants that people would have been exposed to at the time of Alice James, we, we can back construct justifications for, or potential sort of retro diagnoses for why she was so ill for so long. As you say, things even like the, you know, the beautiful William Morris wallpaper prints that, that we all, you know, see now on like end papers of beautiful books and admire that might have been poisonous. The extreme air pollution of the Industrial Revolution. You know, London used to have the kind of pea soup fogs that are described in the Sherlock Holmes novels where you can't see to the end of the street. 
the primary uh, transit was horses and we know what horses do when they're in the street, right? There was an incredible amount of manure around. And, and, and so there was this, um, this epidemic and, and we can make some sense of it, but none of those things existed in quite the same manner when you fell ill. And yet I think now we should return to your story because you'd undertake kind of your own sort of detective investigation mm -hmm. at, to the degree that you can feeling very debilitated about all the things that might be making you ill. And you go through a lot of candidates. Can, can you talk us through some of your, yeah. your thinking? For, I'll say that like the three main things that I, um, that I covered in the book were um, toxicants in the domestic environment, and so um, there's a lot that I learned about the ways that the Environmental Protection Agency is not, not actually protecting us. It's protecting uh, corporations that um, it's pretty tightly intertwined with, unfortunately. And so even things like air fresheners and scented candles and so forth, um, and even the shampoos that we use, they have chemicals in them that um, sometimes are um, known or suspected carcinogens or um, known or suspected to cause neurological issues. And nobody knows, like one could suggest that maybe one of those, you know, maybe this air freshener in itself isn't bad. I mean, it's bad for me because I'll get headaches or other, and other people with chemical sensitivities. But none, nobody knows what the effect is of all the chemicals that we're exposed to. And the toxicants in our in our home and office environments are much higher than even at a Superfund site, the air outside in a Superfund site. That's in the books. So there's, it's, there's research there you can, pe people can look up. So that's one place that I looked. The other place that I looked was um, at Stress in America. And I've always discussed that a little bit. And I was under a tremendous amount of stress because I'd just moved here with no friends. And, um, to start here to Maine and to start my adult life with like, I don't know, maybe I had a thousand dollars in my pocket, which maybe not, maybe I had 500. I don't know, but it wasn't a lot to start an adult life and get a job. I didn't have a job. I had to get the job and then, and then fell ill. And it, it may be that the, I was susceptible to the mono at that time because of the stress. And it, I feel like it's also likely that part of the reason why I didn't recover was because of the tremendous amount of stress I was under as a result of being too sick to take care of myself at the time in my life when I was trying to do that for the first time. And then the other, the other thing that I cover in the book is are the problems in the medical system, some of which I've already just talked about and many of which we know, but there's like pretty jaw dropping data um, that I was able to fit into the book. But the, um, for me, there, there's one other piece that I think is critical, and we're only at the beginning of knowing, and but that's that um, there's, there is probably a genetic component to an illness like mine, um, and um, sometimes gene, genes can get triggered in, in epigenetics. Sometimes things get triggered and sometimes they don't, and what can trigger them is things like stressors. So that that's that's a, actually a short answer for a very I mean the for a subject that I covered in the whole book. <laughs> so so I want to remind people we're about halfway through the hour now that now is an excellent time to put in your questions and comments into to the comment pane of wherever you happen to be watching us, whether that's on Facebook or on LinkedIn, um, on on X formerly Twitter, you will have to comment into our uh, and tag our account and we will see it there, but we would love to hear what you were thinking about this conversation. So, so London, I think it's an important to make the point that, you know, here you are talking to me, you, you are very animated, and you have just published a book with a major publisher, and having written a couple of books, I understand how big an effort that is, and, and you look and sound perfectly healthy. And yeah. so I don't want people to, you know, I wonder that if people are thinking, oh, well, this happened to her when she was in her 20s, but it's all over now. But in fact, this went on for a very long time that, that you, yeah. were, you were struggling with this, not just for a year or two, but for many, many years. Yes. Thank you for acknowledging that. And yeah, um, the thing the thing about this illness and it's it's so common that people will say, well, you you look good. And they'll often say it as a compliment, um, 
but for the person, it often can be received as dismissive of their actual bodily experience because often we don't look sick, except for the maybe the sickest of people who lose weight, who get like very um, bony because they are allergic to sensitive to so many foods and and other things. But we do tend to look normal. But it's also true that I am able to be pretty animated right now, and I'm delighted that that is so. But yes, this has been a lifelong struggle since. So I got sick in 1989. Um, the book sort of in part traces my many, many, many efforts to find some way to get better. And since um, traditional medicine didn't have answers for me, I, um, I tried many other alternative routes as well. And then I did, um, I did recover in 2017 fully and for th for maybe it was 2016 and um i was able to live a full delightful life i'm i'm not going to say the one of the best things that happened because it's at the end of the book and i don't want to ruin the ending but um it was such a delight and then um in october 2019 before the pandemic i got a cold just a right. It wasn't COVID. It was just a regular cold. It wasn't even that bad. And I was under a lot of stress for the book deadline that I knew I wasn't going to hit. And I think the combination of those two things and my, my long history with, um, ME CFS and, and the sort of PTSD like symptoms that go along with that. I, I, you, despite my best efforts, um, I, I started getting fatigued. I didn't know why it was, it totally freaked me out. I was trying to, you know, do all the things that I knew to do to take care of myself and nothing was working. And I was, I was bedridden, uh, for the better part of seven months, unable to work at all on my book. I hadn't been that sick since 1989, 1990. I never thought I'd get that sick again. It was completely devastating. It's terrifying. So that's why COVID is terrifying for me. I've never had COVID. I'm just mask everywhere. I haven't, I've barely traveled. I don't eat out. I, um, uh, so yeah, I mean, this, this illness is a very difficult illness. Um, most people with MECFS do not achieve full recovery. And in my case, what I would say now is that I had achieved uh, remission and um, I'm doing, I'm so grateful that I'm like well enough to be sitting up and talking to you. I could not have done this during that time. There, I, my energy was below zero. Just the slightest effort um, was, I mean, I was exhausted even when I was lying in bed. It was a great reminder of how horrific it was the first time, mm -hmm. but I, I hope never to be reminded again. <laughs> well, that that is a great segue to a question that's been asked from uh, one of our listeners who asks, um, do you feel like your experience with uh, this traumatic experience affected your memory at all or affected your recollection of the past? Are, are there any challenges that you experience either with your memory or with your sort of integration of this story as a result of the trauma you've been through? So that's a great question because as a therapist, I know where that question is coming from because when people are in an acute trauma, our brains don't work the same way. And, um, it tends to cause things to sort of, it, it tends it, to make it difficult to tell a linear story actually. Um, and, but I don't think, I don't think that I, that happened. I do have some memory issues now, but I think that's being a middle-aged woman, uh, middle, uh, postmenopausal woman under stress. It seems to me pretty common. It's just short-term memory stuff, but mostly I feel like I have a pretty, um, cohesive memory of my past. I also have quite a lot of journals and letters and so forth and did a lot of referring to that stuff when I was uh, working on the book and writing the book itself um, sort of helped. I wouldn't say it helped me reclaim the memory because I really, I think I had it, but it helped me to put it in some order. So we have more questions from listeners, which is fantastic. I, um, I want to add one little piece, which is yeah. 
Um, I suspect that I was born with my fragmented way of thinking. I don't think that's a trauma response. And I think it's, um, I didn't, I used to think it was a failure when I tried to write linear narratives and I couldn't, but um, I, I love how American Breakdown came out in its non-linear way. And I think there, I love reading uh, lyric essays that are non-linear. So it doesn't have to be a trauma response. In the early in the book, you say that as a as you were interrogating your own illness and and the sort of cultural frame around your illness, you spent years researching. And here I'll quote: American history, nineteenth century and contemporary toxicology, biology, medical history, economics, environmental history, sociology, and chaos theory. And that is a, a well. You're you're reporting on your own book, so of course it's accurate. But it's it's a fantastic distillation of all the strands in the narrative that you tell, and all the places that your mind goes to again as you're both telling this story and also interrogating your telling of the story at the same time. So you mentioned perimenopause a moment ago, um, and so that's a, an excellent segue to a question that someone is asking. Um, how do you feel about engaging with traditional healthcare now? So straight ahead <laughs> medicine. Do you feel, do you trust it? And, and if not, how do you, as someone who does occasionally need care, how do you make sense of that? That's a great question. I truly believe that there is value in the sort of Cartesian mechanistic kinds of uh, treatments that we have. I, 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 in the book, I'm pretty critical of the pharmaceutical industry, but that doesn't mean I don't use pharmaceuticals. I do, but I don't think they should be the first line of defense. Usually. I mean, maybe I, well, I, that, I, that's probably too expansive. I would say for someone, for someone like me, um, there are so many other things that we can try first that can, there are, there are supplements that are, um, diet and exercise. I, I write a, about, uh, my functional medicine, my care under the care of functional medicine doctors, both of whom were MDs, um, but they're trained in something called functional medicine, which really looks at the body as a whole system and is able to, um, to do lab tests, to study like what's going on metabolically, to, um, to figure out like where are there deficiencies that are personalized to the person. And so, um, so I really, I do believe in the value of um, allopathic medicine or just the traditional medicine, but I, I think it has some severe limits that haven't been ac adequately acknowledged by researchers and by doctors. It's so time, like we need to move towards a new paradigm and not take away the former one, like God forbid, like x-rays, we need x-rays, we need like antibiotics, we need those things, but to add on. So a thing that's very interesting to me in, in over the course of the book, over the long story that you tell is all the different modalities that you try from starting out with traditional medicine, seeking help for that first intense extended bout of fatigue. But then when that doesn't work, when they don't have any more answers for you or when they dismiss your experience, that you're kind of willing to try anything. And um, as I was reading it, there were some of, I, I confess that some of the modalities that you described were familiar to me. And I thought, oh, there's probably some value in that. And I found myself being kind of judgy about some of them too. Like, did she really try that? Did that really, really, did, did she think that was going to make a difference? And then I reminded myself, I sort of checked myself and thought, you know, you were entitled to look for answers in whatever place was going to make a difference because your entire life had been turned upside down. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if, like, as you were trying all these things, did you ever find yourself having to justify them <laughs> to people? <laughs> to, oh, to others? Yeah. Or to yourself? Well, I mean, I'm sure my, yes, my dad um, is very pragmatic. Um, but he's also pretty good at keeping his mouth shut up. Not, not being openly judgmental. Um, yeah, why can't, I can't think of having to, like, I think I had support of good people around me, basically. And um, yeah, I mean, there are things that I myself, I mean, I knew, I don't even want to say the one thing, I'm not going to, I don't want to say the one thing that I did 
that's like that I had vowed I would not do, but I was so desperate. I tried that too. And the thing is, like, what's the what's the alternative? Nothing. So for me, anybody who's really sick and traditional healthcare says, it's all in your head, nothing I can do for you. If they're not like trying all the things, anything, then they're really good accepting what is. And that can be a good quality, but I was not, that's not my natural way. I, it's something I've had to learn to get better at accepting and there's value in that, but I was determined to get better and I was willing to try anything. And I was the most compliant patient anybody would ever find. I stopped eating all the things that people said would help me feel better if I stopped, including my favorite thing, sugar. You know, I just, I was willing to give up anything to get my energy back and recover and be able to live a full life. And um, I don't think anybody can be um, criticized. Criticize isn't quite the word. I uh, can't think of the word, but like, I just like when the alternative is nothing, you'll do just about anything. So here's, here's a question from the audience. Um, we are going to get to long COVID and I think this gives us a segue into it. Um, so Harley asks, what advice would you have from someone else who's potentially in your situation, who's someone who's battling some mysterious illness and, and gets judged for it, gets labeled as attention seeking or not really sick? How do you, how do you, how should people speak back to that? Whew. Um, in some ways it kind of depends on who's doing the judging, right? Like if it's your healthcare provider, find a new one. Like, I, I mean, I'm in, I live in a city, so I'm able to be choosy. And um, so my hope would be that you could find a new one. I stayed much longer than I should have with my first doctor because I didn't know any better. I was 21. Um, if it's a family member, give them my book. <laughs> you know, like I spent 20, more than 20 years writing that book to give data with, and there are endnotes to the data um, to help people understand the validity of this illness and multiple chemical sensitivity and um, all the reasons why these illnesses may exist. Um, and if not, my there might there are others there are other books too. Or if you read it yourself, you can maybe memorize some data. But I was so fortunate that my father did not understand what I was going through. He didn't understand chronic fatigue syndrome in 1989, but he kept reading about it um, and sending me articles and talking to colleagues. He, it, like, he was a very productivity oriented, pragmatic man. So he tried. So I'm really fortunate. Other people I know have family members who won't. And I don't know the answer other than decide if it's worth engaging with them. And decide how much. And same with friends. If you have friends that are dismissive of your, your illness experience, you might, and they won't listen to you when there's, you know, when you can give them information about how real it is, then how much are they friends? So what you're describing, um, I'm afraid, is the experience of very many people over the past couple of years as we've been visited with the COVID pandemic. Yeah. And out of that, many, many people, we still don't know the true percentage, have been left with long lasting symptoms, sometimes very disabling, very hard to understand. You named a few of them earlier. And um, and I think in many cases have been dismissed as this being psychogenic or attention seeking. And yep. I'm wondering what this felt like to you to, to watch this happen and watch long COVID emerge. Um, when COVID hit, first of all, I was already housebound by my own illness, but I, and lots of other people in the MECFS community knew what was coming next. And it's like such a powerless feeling. Like the only power I had is like Facebook is my primary social networking system. And just, I kept posting articles. I kept saying like, be, you know, 
wear your mask. You There's a 10 to 30% chance you're going to get long COVID if you get this. That was the case now. I, I think it's getting lower. Um, just to feel like I was warning people because I had no idea. I would never have imagined at 21 that I was going to get sick with an illness that was completely debilitating and that I was going to live with for the rest of my life. And um, I was healthy and I was young. And so long COVID can also happen to anybody. And you don't know until it's too late. And I, I don't want that for people. And the fact is there are now more people with long COVID than there are people with ME-CFS. And 50% of those with long COVID also um, have the symptoms that would qualify them for a diagnosis of ME-CFS. Mm. So there are a huge number more of people, people like me than there, than there ever were before. So there's two questions from listeners, watchers, viewers, um, and they're, they're very similar. So I'm going to sort of mush them together. Um, so they both really kind of ask, how could medicine have done better? Both, but and I'm going to extend this both to your experience as being part of the chronic fatigue community and also to the long COVID situation. How could healthcare have been more compassionate? And how can physicians do a better job of listening to patients' own testimony about themselves? It's it's like that question answers itself because when you ask the first, like how could how could medicine have done better? The first thing that came to me was listen to the patients. And in fact, that there was an outbreak of, uh, you know, what became called chronic fatigue syndrome in uh, T Lake Tahoe, New York, and some other um, small town or small city. Um, and those two doctors recognized and listened to their patients, and they'd been longtime patients, and so they knew their patients. And they were the ones who sent the report to the CDC to tell the CDC something is happening. There's some sort of epidemic happening. And the CDC came, and this research is in my book, but it came from very dogged um, firsthand research by um, Hillary Johnson, who wrote Osler's Web. Um, the CDC eventually came, but they were more interested, the two men who came were more interested in skiing and taking in the sites than they were interested in actually looking at meeting with patients they mostly sort of looked at some some files i don't they may have met with one or two patients they basically thought it was like um women's you know yuppie women who did oh in fact there's a quote in my book who just don't they want somebody else to drive their um fancy car i can't even remember i can't even remember so like from the very beginning and the two doctors who were listening to their patients were men but the two researchers who um, didn't, and then the rest of the researchers at CDC weren't listening, nor the NIH was not um, granting grants to, to doctors and researchers who wanted to research the disease. And doctors were even told that it would be a, like a death sentence to their career if they decided to research the disease, not doctors, but researchers. And so like, what, what could be different? Listen to patients, fund, the illness um and and with with long covid um i know that uh, i can't speak i don't know enough to speak adequately critically or in praise of the work that's been done with long covid i know there's been a, a chunk of funding given for research i think people with long covid were disappointed that it, um, more of it was going to um, epidemiology than it was towards like finding out like how to treat people who are desperate to get better. Um, but we need more funding. We still do. And we need researchers who are willing to, to look at a different angle. They need to include patients who, especially I know the MECFS community, they are so educated. And as you said at the very beginning, that group has been so proactive in getting doctors and researchers to, to listen to them as, as an activist group and um, to get to get more than we would have otherwise if they hadn't done that. And we need research to integrate patients into their decision making around the research questions they're going to do and how they're going to do it and make sure that they're not overlapping with research that's already been done and shown to be a failure, which some of that is in my book, too. 
So I was going to ask you what your vision was for a, you know, a different, better kind of medicine and public health. And I think you're giving us a menu for <laughs> ways in which the experience of patients who ought to be the best authorities on their own experience um, can be honored and, and listened to and integrated and, and research agendas can be built around that and, and not, not to exclude them, but to include them. Yes. And then the other piece is um, when um, HMOs were introduced into our um, insurances, which I remember that being in the news right in 89 when I first got sick, they, I feel I'm pretty sure that's when they first started becoming a thing. And we were told they will make uh, healthcare less expensive. But what they really did was create a lot more pressure for doctors to push patients through quickly. And so patients are lucky to get a 15 minute uh, appointment and complex uh, multi-system illnesses like mine cannot be um, effectively cared for in a 15 minute appointment. So there needs to be more room for flexibility. We need to sort of, <laughs> I don't even have to say it, but we need healthcare for everybody that's not funded by um, capitalist uh, organizations who have um, CEOs making a huge amount of money and, um, and that are, um, and that are um, beholden to their stockholders to uh, make money first and foremost, no matter, no matter what the uh, consequences are for actual people. So we're almost done, but there's one more question from the audience that I wanna make sure that I, um, that I voice. And that is, you've given us this fantastic um, hour long glimpse into your complicated history. You've, you've been so animated, you've, you've drawn so much together. Are you gonna suffer as a result of this? Have you expended too much energy talking to us? Thank you for that question. It's just such a empathic question to ask. Um, and I will say that talking about this book in many ways energizes me. I mean, I am so happy that it's finally out in the world. I'm so happy that I finally was able to find a way to like put up, all my experiences and all this learning into something that makes sense and um, that other people can now read and that can help other people, not just help people who read it, who have these similar illnesses to feel seen and heard, just like I did when I read about Alice. And I know that's happening, but on a macro level to help, to help change the culture. So that, that is so fulfilling for me and energizing for me. And I love talking about this stuff. And yeah, I, um, I'm just going to take the rest of the night off and do something for pleasure. Um, and, and that's not always, I mean, I'm a pretty driven person, but like living with this illness for so long has taught me to listen to my body and to give it more gifts than I otherwise would be inclined to do. And um, I deserve a night off and I'm going to do it. I feel well, like such a rebel even saying that. <laughs> so un-American. Well, so un-American. Well, by, by, by spending so much time with us, by e explaining your history and recounting it for us, and by writing this fantastic book, you have given us a gift. And so I think you deserve a gift in return. So go and have the rest of the night off. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, London, for, for spending this hour with me. And thanks for a wonderful interview. Thank you. So that's it, listeners, for this edition of the Health Storytelling author Q&A series. Please consider following London at her own site, jenniferlondon.com. And as you heard her say, she is on Facebook as Jennifer London Writer. That's her primary social media presence. And buy her book, which is available from her publisher, Harper Wave, and at Amazon, of course, and also at bookshop.org which is the anti-Amazon. It's a platform that funnels orders to independent bookstores. And if you like going to bookstores, we urge you to follow the link that we'll provide for IndieBound.com. That site will show you which 